they probably want you to press something on your end if, if for yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, whenever I do this with Anna, she's got to do hair and makeup. Peter, not so much. He looks like this every day, folks. Is there any manure on me? <laughs> <laughs> speaking of manure, Peter, you you were <laughs> speaking of sh bullshit. Uh, you work closely with animals. I mean, you're look every everybody we get on here is like, yeah, you know, we'll get the Kate Shanahan's and they stale for seed oils. Yeah, got it, got it. We'll get all of these different people. Stay away from this. Stay away from that. But you come from the other end, and I, I remember the first time I became interested in having you on. It was basically because we um, we started. I started hearing something new. You know, I started doing this in nineteen nineteen in twenty. Let's call it twenty twelve because I can't really remember. So we've been doing this for a little over ten years, and at first. I was just telling people, hey, stay off the sugars and grains, because I didn't really want to. I didn't want to say go into dietary ketosis because I knew every whack job out there was going to go, oh, this guy's talking about ketoacidosis that can kill you. And I didn't want to go down that road. I changed everything to no sugars, no grains and tried to, quote unquote, sugarcoat it that way. And uh, it seemed to work really well. Uh, but then at some point, and, and by the way, the, the vegan community and all of the naysayers was like, oh, yeah, this doesn't work. You, you know, the only way to lose weight is calorie deficit and blah, 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 blah. This guy and every other guy like him, they're all wrong. And well, they can say that for so long. But then at some point when you have nothing but success story after success story, they can't keep saying that they have to change their tune at some point. Right. They, they can't keep, just keep going. Hey, a ketogenic diet doesn't work, or there's no way you can sustain it. There's no way when you start getting people losing 50, 100, 150, 300 pounds, all of a sudden, they have to sit around and go, uh -oh. oh, boy, we got a problem now. What mm -hmm. else can we go after? Mm. You know what? Let's go after a ruminant. Let's leave Bambi alone because we, you know, we still like Bambi. <clears throat> what can we go after? Well, we we almost killed all the buffalo in this country. Is you know, trying to get those bad boys back. Who else can we go after? I got it. Let's go after the cow. Let's go after beef. Let's go after steers. Let's tell them that somehow, every time these animals fart and burp, they're putting gas into the ozone layer that we will never. I mean, we're hurting the earth. Cows are killing the earth. Mm -hmm. Let's start there, Peter, because that's when I became interested in you, because guys like you started coming out of the woodwork going, oh, no, I'm an agronomer. And we say the opposite of that, right? Or am I getting that wrong? No, it's essentially correct. First of all, it's belches, not farts. You're welcome. Um, that this emission of methane is part of the normal digestive process of a ruminant, whether it's Bambi, a wild ruminant, or a cow, um, because we, we have cellulose, which human beings can't utilize. And in order to break that down, we need these bacteria to do that. And part of their functioning is to release methane. So whether that happens in a swamp or in a rumen, that's just one of the things that that has to happen in order for that CO2 to complete its cycle from the atmosphere through a plant via photosynthesis, then in an animal in this case, and that liberates methane, but that methane is oxidized back is oxidized to CO2 within about 10 years. So it's a very short cycling of CO2, like we would talk about any other natural cycle. Uh, and in fact, some very recent, I guess it was less than a year ago, some scientists, in fact, even the IPCC reported that using, they've been using the wrong metric to estimate the global warming potential of methane. And so by using that incorrect metric, they've been overestimating the impact of this enteric methane by only three to four times. Okay, now what group <laughs> is this that figured this out? This is the, uh, well, these were some researchers out of Oxford University, right. but it's cited in the last IPCC report. 
in the science section. You have to read the science section, not the summary for policymakers, because that's a completely different beast. So we now have the ability to say, if we look with more sophistication at the nutritive value of the food that's being produced, whether that's red meat or dairy, and, and we look at the actual utilizable nutrients and compare that rather than just crude protein yield, that alone brings down the impact of dairy by about a factor of 100. And then when we look at this three to four you know, time reduction, we're now at a point where we can see the greenhouse emission intense, greenhouse gas emission intensity of dairy to be less than soy juice beverage. Okay, when you say bring it down by by a factor of 100 to the average person, and, and then you said four times that, what does that mean? How wrong did we get it? Can, can you put a percentage on that? Besides just saying a factor of 100? Can, because yeah. people are going to say, well, what does that mean? Uh, what, what is that? It, it uh, means that we've been sold a bill of goods in terms of the environmental impact of animal source food production compared to plant source food production. And we've had this conversation as if plant source food production doesn't have any impact on the environment. And so, but it does, it has a tremendous, everything we do has an impact on the environment and we're not good at weighing pluses and minuses. So what this better information would let us understand is one, ruminants are absolutely essential for sustainable food systems. Right. Full stop. Um, and then when we understand that animal source food is essential for proper human development and I would argue flourishing, then, okay, it's, it's absolutely essential and it probably has a lower impact than we've been led to believe. And then the only thing that's left, as far as I'm concerned in the conversation, is the so-called, you know, health risks that some want to believe comes from natural saturated fats or cholesterol or red meat writ large or animal protein for you know the, the those are the arguments you've been familiar with for decades yeah yeah i i have a neighbor who is a retired professor and has written i don't want to exaggerate i think he's written seven books and he's one of the foremost authorities in the world on wood and trees. Um, and um, I don't even know what you would call that type of professor. Um, I won't give his last name because I don't have his permission here, but we'll call him Hank. Well, because that's his first name. And um, Hank and I were having a scotch one night and we, we were discussing this and, and he was asking me about what I do. And I, I was telling him kind of what I said at the beginning of this podcast, you know, they're now meandering into this <laughs> you know, meat is not just murder, but it's killing the planet. Mm -hmm. And Hank just had this information on the tip of his tongue. He, and he goes, you know, Southern accent and everything and uh, super learned guy, just super smart guy. He goes, well, you know, which animal puts off the most methane? Do, do you know what it is, Peter? Well, I would suspect that it's termites. He said it was termites. He goes, yeah. termites put off more methane than you know, because there's more termites on the planet than anything else. And they I guess they put out little tiny termite farts or belches. And um, the other day, why well, one of them lit it up in my uh, basement, here. I was like, whoo, come on, termites. Um, but you know, <laughs> you he blame was, the termites. But when you think about all the wood on the planet, all the trees and, and everything, and the number of termites, he was like, Oh, yeah, termites are are the number one cause of methane in the atmosphere. And yeah. yeah, I don't see the environmentalists going, hey, we need to get rid of these termites. Well, because because number one, you can't. Just right. like you can't get rid of all ruminants. Uh, you mentioned my movie. Um, you you watched the movie, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the guy that, from Beyond Meats, Brown, he says, hey, if it was up to me, cows would be eliminated from the planet by 2030 just eliminated from the planet. And 
you know, we found four or five examples of him saying that in media. I didn't have to dig to go find that. This is something this guy believes. He mm -hmm. wants to eliminate cattle from the planet. So then my question becomes, okay, we get rid of cattle. Then what? Do we go yeah. for bison? Do we go for deer? Which other ruminant do we go after after that? Are, are we just wiping Bambi off the planet? Do you agree, Peter? Or am I just is this hyperbole? What? What are we doing here? No, I think that there's a very strong vein of people who are anti animal agriculture, regardless of what the animals are, regardless of how they're managed. And they're, you know, doing it in stages, you know, there, there are more horses in the United States than there are dairy cows. Wow. Okay. But they're smart enough not to go after the horses first. Right. Right. Just, just like they're smart enough not to go after the pet animals because the true animal rightist don't believe that you should have pets. So it's on their agenda, but it's just further down. So they'll get to you. It doesn't matter. <laughs> so that's one of my arguments against some who want to argue, look, we, you know, if we manage this way versus that way, we're better than you, and that should get us dispensation. And my response is, first of all, you know, don't be beating your chest saying how virtuous you are. And number two, understand that they'll get to you eventually, right? They, they, they have this as a stage. So no, it's absolutely true. Um, and this is in the face of estimates that have been done that suggest that if we were to get rid of all animal agriculture in the United States, we would make a marginal difference in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, something on the order of 2.6%, somewhere in there, as I recall, of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions would be reduced, but it would come at the cost of Ex they said creating, I would say, exacerbating nutrient deficiencies and imbalancing our food system. <laughs> so, right. and, and, and then we need to understand we are in the midst of a crisis in terms of fertilizer costs, diesel costs, and global food supply. Right. It, th this is very bad what's coming at us. And so we have these, you know, technocrats that believe that they have they they alone they alone only they know the answer and so it's it's it should be a concern to anyone who would like to make sure that they can feed their families what they think is appropriate what's affordable what's accessible to them because we have people who very much want to control the food system and that begins with the food production all right. So the beef industry, just to take one, is in every state in the United States. Right. I mean, it is the local food. <laughs> right. um, so if that's what you're interested in, then, you know, eat beef. Um, and then there's some other things that we could dig a little deeper. But basically, as I've said, there is no sustainable food system without livestock agriculture in general and ruminant animal agriculture in particular. And so just trying to get that message out against this tsunami of well-funded and very vocal opposition. And, and the way I think will make the most sense is to introduce people to people like yourself and others who have been helping people get well or stay well, although increasingly it's get well. <laughs> um, and then when these issues come up, people like you and others know that there's other information available. And, you know, I was trained by people who were trained by people who've been looking at some of these topics for decades, and we just haven't done a good job of getting that information out to people. So, you know, I'm trying to build bridges between the various tribes that I belong to. Um, I've been given the title of Don Pedro, the sod father of the Ruminati, because I'm not clever enough to come up with that stuff on my own. So basically, the ruminant is a wonder of creation, and it, it far predates human, humanity or primates. Yeah. You, you, you had this changing ecological scene where the grasses became dominant, and then the ruminants came along. And we're able to utilize that resource 
as as uh, as one of a very specialized herbivore and then you had carnivores that were preying on the ruminants but apparently our ancient ancestors were clever enough to take a roundish sort of stone and break bones to get at the high value resource inside marrow brain whatever and act as scavengers and then that led to our development as i understand people like jessica thompson and others who have talked about this kind of a um, model of human development this is who we are and so trying to tell people look animal source food is essential for public health right we right. Were, were in the midst of this unsustainable crisis in any conversation that's that's going to humanity's diet is already plant-based right right the majority of calories in our diets in high-income countries let alone globally are coming from plants that means it's sugar and starch right the majority of protein in humanity's diet comes from plants it's only in the high-income countries that we begin to get the majority coming from animal source food but if you look globally humanity's supply more of humanity's crude protein supply is coming from cereals than from all animal source foods combined which is maybe that's the problem yeah that's that's really sad when you think about it by the way I, I want to go back to something you said a few minutes back because I harp on this on the show all the time whenever I talk about you know PETA and some of these and you didn't mention PETA by name but I tell people oh if you think that they are good and virtuous and the whole thing think again it's in their bylaws it used to be at the top of their bylaws they've been smart enough to bury it but it's still there that they don't think you should possess pets so according to peter you should open your front door peter and um just let your dog or cat just run outside run out into the street and get killed right right now just open the door and just let your animal run free that's they think we're imprisoning these animals we've enslaved these animals and everything else this is a crazy nutty organization yeah and i, I once it, otherwise it, think again to put it another way i heard one person and i can't remember who i got this from but they said if you believe if you believe in animal rights you can't be for human rights wow and that that you're, you're right you're right and you know I, as i tell everyone who want to have the conversation we forget because you know we live in cozy homes and we do this and that and the other thing we've removed ourselves and we've somehow convinced ourselves that we're not part of the food chain and <laughs> as i tell everyone go out with nothing other than yourself onto the serengeti and you'll see how quickly you're part of the food chain mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. wants to eat you and you want to eat something mm. so uh that a friend of mine, a friend of mine went with a, a Cub Scout troop out to Newport Bay, which is just an hour or so west of here on the coast. And, you know, they're on one of these excursion boats and they're getting the lecture. And they said, now there's been some great whites sighted in this area. And if we see one, we're going back in. And somebody, you know, made a snide remark about, oh, you're afraid of him jumping up in the boat. And the answer was, no, but you see all those sea lions? <laughs> if they see it, they're going to jump up on the boat, swamp the boat, and then they're going to swim faster than you do. Yeah. So, um, you know, there's other things like we take for granted where, as I mentioned just a little bit ago, we're at record prices for fertilizer. Well, the majority of fertilizer that's used to produce human edible crops globally comes from animal manure. We still have about a billion or so human beings that are dependent on burning dirty biofuels, including dung. Right. You know, the majority of farmers in the world that produce the majority of food it's the small and medium, you know, mixed farming systems that produce the majority of food globally. The majority of them are dependent on draft animals. 
So you're talking about eliminating animal agriculture. What are you going to do to replace the fertilizer? What are you going to do to replace the tractors? You know, the virtually no one in this world is going to ever eat these faux products that are being envisioned as this solution. And, and so it's, it's something completely different taking place. But in the meantime, we have, and I've talked about this, that we have this hard reality of a high quality objective evidence of human beings being harmed because they get too little animal source food in their diet for whatever reason. Okay. And when I say animal source food, it doesn't only mean red meat, right. you know, meat, eggs, dairy, seafood, whatever is appropriate. They just don't get it. A lot of times it's economics, what have you. <clears throat> But we've got this controlling myth of harms coming from too much. Right. And every time I go, well, where's your evidence of too much? They point to these kind of epidemiological surveys or models like, you know, the bur global burden of disease where suddenly the numbers get inflated by 36 times without any new information. You know, they'll do things like they'll assume nothing but harm, no benefit. Right. So, um, and, and I think it's really important for people to understand that, no, these are essential ingredients to healthy life and flourishing societies. Well, look, I mean, we have Mitt Lerner, uh, we had him in a movie, and he was talking about, you know, the grasslands. And that was one of the first things, you know, they call you the sod father, because you, you talk about the grass and, and what ruminants mean to the grass. And I know you've done it on this podcast before. But Peter, we have a brand new audience now, because I was on Mike Rose show, and we've picked up a couple of 100,000 more people from that. Would you mind going through that again and explaining why we need ruminants and how that helps the grass and it stops erosion and on and on and on. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Yeah. <clears throat> well, so the, the soils that we have that are suitable for cultivation to produce annual crops are something like 4% of the earth's surface. Meanwhile, about a quarter of the Earth's surface is rangeland, pasture land, f forestry. All of those can be grazed. In fact, most of those what we call arable land, that, that 4%, most of that was grassland to begin with that got converted. I mean, substantial amounts of forest get converted as well. So it's arguable that the ecosystem that's in greatest peril globally are the natural grasslands. Right. Um, and, and so we've lost 90 some percent of the tall grass prairie, which is what covered Iowa and Illinois and Indiana and that corn belt area. Um, so one of the things that happens when we till soil is we make it susceptible to erosion, wind and water. The best way to prevent that is to have a perennial plant cover, grassland, sod. When the European settlers came into that area of North America, the sod was so thick that their plows couldn't cut it. And they had to invent a whole new plow in order to till the soil. Their mindset was improving the land meant tilling. Right. Okay, so the, the sod was so thick that they built houses out of it um, that when they t when they were able to plow it with these metal plows they said the sound of the roots being cut sounded like fabric being torn wow and and when you till soil you introduce oxygen which is encourages oxidation of organic matter so this is all degradation of soil. Okay, the sod itself, the grass itself is a lot of cellulose, which are glucose units hooked together in a different way than we hook them, 
we, then they are hooked together when we are make you stars. God, Peter. Is exactly. You, I, you know, sod father, sod yeah. father needs humility. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so because of that different linkage, no vertebrate animal can break those bonds to liberate glucose. Right. So glucose is a primer is a sugar that's formed in car in photosynthesis. So photosynthesis, you have the sunlight being used to, along with water and CO2 to create carbohydrate. So this is the source of energy into our terrestrial biosphere. Right. But because of that unique linkage, no vertebrate animal can access that energy. Only the microbes can do it. But microbes can live in the soil or they can live in the rumen of these animals, cows, sheep, goats, deer, moose, bison, buffalo. Um, and because of that, these animals can utilize this high fiber, low fat, poor protein quality and quantity diet and end up digesting. So they ingest that, you know, hay, pasture, whatever, and they end up absorbing short chain volatile fatty acids and microbial protein and some other products of microbial fermentation. And from that, we get milk and meat and byproducts like leather. Right. And, and so these have been enormously important for societal development for the last 8,000, 10,000 years. Right. Just a little while. Um, so uh, there's been a lot of interest over the last several years in what's called soil health. And this is understanding that if I grow a corn crop, and we can argue about corn, but if I grow a corn crop, it would be really good if I would plant something to keep that soil covered in between the corn crops. Right. And then people are finding out, and you know, cattle can utilize the leftover from the corn crop plus whatever we've planted to keep it covered so we're producing beef and there are people doing work now that say look this was from southern brazil and where they're growing soybeans and then they 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 harvest the soybeans they plant a winter annual forage crop they graze beef on that and then they plant soybeans the following spring well, because soybeans are the high value commodity, they've been fertilizing the soybeans. Well, what they said is, what if we put the fertilizer on the forage? Oof. And what, what they found was they produced more forage, which meant more beef. And because so little of what those animals consume leaves the field, it gets cycled. So then they produce a soybean crop following that with no more fertilizer, they produce equal yields. So we're producing more feed, more food on the same land, which is going to be critical going forward right. with the same or lower inputs, which is going to be critical going forward. Plus we get ever benefit comes from having a more vigorous stand of forage, those fibrous roots perennial roots are much better for soil than annual roots because that's how the plants live year to year is having that kind of more extensive root system so all of these things point to how we're going to have to do more and more of that going forward well, so well, let me ask a question there i mean if they're doing it in brazil and it's working you know flawlessly that that way why can't we do it here? Why won't we do it here? Are we trying it here? Is anyone doing it here? What's going on? So um, it's not that we can't. And yes, people are looking at it. One reason we haven't is because we haven't had to. Brazil imports almost all their fertilizer. They're one of the largest fertilizer importers in the world. They're going to have troubles. Right. Um, at the same time, their soils are more weathered than most of the United States soils. And so they're very susceptible to degradation. 
because they're already well down that path naturally. And so they've, they've been learning how to, you know, cover them because they had to, because otherwise their soils just become unproductive. Now that can happen for us as well. Um, but we don't have that same pressure. Um, but I think that there is, there, there is a community of researchers, frankly, they've been looking at this for years, um, and that work continues. So there's good news. But shouldn't we get in front of it? You know, wouldn't it stand the reason to get in front of it and not wait until it becomes, do we always have to wait until something's a crisis? Or do you know of yeah. any situation where we go, you know what, we see this coming down the road, like, I'll give you an example. And we can use this example. It's analogous to what everything we're talking about. Everyone's excited about electric cars, right? Mm -hmm. Because they go, hey, electric cars, there's, there's no emissions coming out of the cars. Look, they don't even need a radiator on the front. You know, they don't, they, they, they very proudly make the front of the car smooth to show you don't have to even have a vent and the whole thing. And everyone loves these Teslas and the whole thing. And and they come on, Ben, Ford's making an F-150. It's completely, you know, you, you can run a house for three days on it. It's like, yeah, but then how do you drive the truck away if you ran your house on it? And, and on and on and on. I, I just asked the critical questions. And then I, whenever people talk about electric cars, I'll say, okay, do you realize that, number one, they have no idea what they're going to do with the batteries once we have all of these batteries hanging around? That's number one. Number two, the energy to put energy in the battery, because the battery is nothing but think of it as a nice chest. You want to fill it up with, with beer and Coca-Cola because you're going out to the beach. At some point, you have to fill it up again. You got to keep filling up that battery with beer and Coca-Cola because you got to go back to the beach. That's coming from a power plant that's either using coal or dinosaur juice, or a combination thereof. Is there a third thing that they're using at power plants? I'm not, I, I know there's some, but- and Nuclear, nuclear hydro, um, hydro, hydro power. Right. But we don't like nuclear in this country for whatever reason. You know, mm -hmm. every time I bring up to, I have a friend and he's, you know, he's very politically motivated. And I'll say, well, what about nuclear? I mean, that's, that's clean power. He goes, three mile island, three mile island, Chernobyl. Chernobyl. And I'm like, okay, okay. That was years ago. I think, I think they figured it out. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong. Peter, do you, do you have any, any thoughts on that? Because this is analogous to what we're talking about here. Here's another situation where I'm okay with electric power, but we need a different source because whether you're dumping the dinosaur juice in your car or is being sent through uh, ACDC, it's the same thing. Am I right? Am I wrong? You tell me. So I, there are lots of things that I pay attention to and I gain a little bit of information, which makes me dangerous. Robert Bryce with a Y, uh, Power Hungry Podcast is somebody that I recommend. He talks to a range of people. Um, and, you know, from him, I get little observations like 45% of humanity consumes less than a thousand kilowatt hours per year. Say that again, Peter. 45% of humanity consumes less than a thousand kilowatt hours per year, okay. which is about a large North American refrigerator. Okay. Which, which means that they don't have any there. Somebody once said it's like they're in Chicago circa 1900. And, and that's they would 45% very... of the population. Exactly. The, the, the populate, I, I've heard this, I think this is true, uh, accurate. Again, I'm, I'm on the raggedy edge of my knowledge, so cut me some slack, but that the population of India that doesn't have reliable access to electricity is larger than the entire population of the United States. I, I would believe that. I've spent time in India. I, I would so, actually believe that. So this is fundamental requirement for a modern society is reliable, affordable electricity. And, and people don't understand that any more than they understand that animal source food is essential for proper human development and function. Right. So, okay, um, the, the, the issue that you raise about why some people do, there's loud, well-funded voices against, and frankly, 
you know, we're not doing well as a society talking about issues in a constructive way. Right. Um, you know, there are those projections that say by 2050, which is now only what, 28 years from now, right. that the we're going to have to double food production. We're going to see an increase of two thirds in the demand for animal source protein. I would argue that that's a dramatic underestimate, that we're going to see human, and of course, we're not increasing the farmland supply. It's under pressure for a number of reasons, uh, that we're seeing an increase in population. The thing that people frequently miss is they assume that's going to come from children, when in fact, the population increase 2100 is going to be from more people living to be seniors. Right. Same number of children 15 and under in 2100 as today, based on projections. Um, that there's going to be this something like 70 some percent of humanity is going to live in urban centers. Wow. So, which I have at times called CAFOs. Um, and then you've also at the same time got this need for doubling current electrical generating capacity in order to meet the development needs. So that's the landscape that we're looking out over. Meanwhile, today, today, we've got something between a quarter and a fifth of children five years and under globally being stunted. This is not only stature this is brain development and you know that's a lifetime problem right. um it, it one estimate was the degree and in some countries it's 40 percent um stunted. stunted children stunted and, and what was the cause is that diet is that economics what what, what plays into it's that? a number of things but one of the chief things is the lack of the essential nutrients provided by animal source food especially right. meat um, at the same time, we've got a third of women of childbearing age being anemic globally, right? But we also have this, it, this also increasing degree of childhood obesity globally, because of course, we've got the highly processed foods, you know, when it's, when it's cheaper to buy soda pop than it is bottled water, and you need something safe to drink. So, so a lot these issues are there and we can see it, but at the same time, we have been talking about protein in a completely inaccurate way in the United States and other high income countries. I got to give a presentation. I, I saw a presentation at a meat science society meeting. He showed that this researcher showed 10 studies where they, they fed lysine deficient and lysine sufficient diets to pigs. And across those 10 studies, they saw three things. The deficient diet produced more subcutaneous fat, more inter intramuscular fat, and smaller loin eye or back muscle. And Peter, are we talking about the, the amino acid lysine? Yes, exactly. One of the branch chain amino acids, probably one of the most important ones for, for building cell, muscular cells and everything else. Or, or, and I could be wrong about that because- uh, globally, globally limiting, not surprising given that most of humanity's protein or more protein comes from cereals, which are deficient in lysine. And then when you process cereals to make them brown and crispy, you make what little lysine was there essentially unavailable. And turning it basically into a sugar through a process called um, um, dextrinization, which uh, Kellogg figured out. But go well, on. the Milliard reaction is the browning of, of irreversibly binding lysine to carbohydrate. It happens in hay that, that's too wet or, or uh, silage that isn't stored properly. So there's an overlap. In any case, I, I leveraged this man's slides because a week or so later, I was in front of a bunch of um, low carb people. And I showed, you know, I got the, the pork board marbling score where you've got the different, you know, pork chops and different degrees of marbling and indicated what the difference would be between deficient and sufficient. And um, 
I had a physician come up to me the next day and say, when you showed those pictures, I thought that's what I'm seeing in my patients. Wow. And he's treating, he's a pain management physician and he's treating a low socioeconomic population. Now we think of highly processed cereal products, very low lysine, you know, maybe, who knows, but I can tell you that for the last almost half century, swine nutritionists have been balancing the swine diets, sorry, rations, based on an essential amino acid basis. And yet we still have people talking about human diets in terms of percent of calories from protein, not understanding that it's not protein, it's we need a certain amount of essential amino acids and we need it, you know, throughout the day. It's got to be in balance. And this is just stuff that I'm aware of as a forage agronomist and I'm trying to bring it to a wider audience. But right. just because something's there doesn't mean we can absorb it. So, you know, I, I can I can show people that, you know, cereals and nuts and legumes, the phosphorus that's in those is primarily in phytate. And we can't utilize phytate. Well, the swine industry's known that for a while. So whatever phosphorus you think you're getting from those food products, it's not utilizable. Now let's look at protein. Protein on a label or in a table is crude protein. They just drop shorten it to protein. Right. Well, what that means is we've analyzed the sample for total nitrogen. We take that percent nitrogen, we multiply it by 6.25 to convert it into crude protein. We've done that for well over 100 years in animal nutrition. It works okay in ruminants because ruminants can use non-protein nitrogen. Well, more correctly, their microbes can and make microbial protein out of nitrate and other nitrogenous material, which then the host animal digests when it digests the microbes. So there is no such thing as an essential amino acid to a ruminant. But we obviously have that, and we haven't been paying as much attention to that as we should have been. We've been squandering resources and time looking at other things. But there's some studies, so to take it back to beyond and impossible. If we look at impossible, which is made with soybeans, yeah, okay, it can qualify as a good source of protein if you just ate the puck, right? But who just eats the puck? Right. Okay. Um, the beyond is made with pea protein. It doesn't qualify as being a good source of protein. Okay. But we put a wheat bun with it and the that that formerly good source of protein called an impossible patty mm -hmm. doesn't provide enough lysine to overcome the deficit in the wheat bun so as a meal it's no longer a good source of protein meanwhile if we look at beef patty or pork patty and put it on a bun it's got m enough lysine to make up for the deficit. So it's it's an excellent source by itself and makes it a good source. So now we have, and it's when we apply those kinds of more um, uh, sophisticated evaluation of, of nutritive value that we get greater separation in the environmental impact. And so it makes animal source food production less impactful when we look at the actual nutrients rather than right. this crude protein. Hey, look, I, I, you're, you're preaching to the choir here. I could not agree more. Um, you know, one of the things that people keep saying to me, especially vegans who just want to argue, I guess. Um, well, I don't think they want to argue. They just want to be right. Everybody wants to be right. I want to be right. I mean, we all want to be right. Um, but then, as I tell everyone, there's a universal truth. You might want to be right, but we can't go off of feelings. There's a universal truth. And whenever I get yelled at on Twitter and, and some vegan says, well, you don't understand, pea protein has more, <laughs> more, 
more of every vitamin and every every amino acid that you need and that that animal protein just doesn't have and it's laughable and i sit there and i go well, who told you that was that michael greger or was that you know which which one of those vegan gods was it Esselstein? who who brought this up to you what was it walter willett himself who's lying to you and telling you this and where did this propaganda start uh but let me ask you i mean we could both agree pea protein is not a complete protein you can't well, you can sustain life on almost anything, as we've learned, but you're not going to be healthy down the road. Yes, no, maybe. C correct. I mean, so just for example, an eight year old boy physically cannot eat enough rice and lentils if he had unlimited access, couldn't eat enough to meet his lysine requirements. Right. Which means he's going to be restricted in his development. So they're just some of these things are hard realities. I understand I have no desire to be the arbiter of anyone's diet. I want to make sure people have information so that they can make a truly informed decision. The unfortunate thing is so many people have been misinformed. And then, as one author said, you combine a legitimate concern with bad information and you make bad decisions right. and and one example is people think that dietary fiber is an essential nutrient that one drives that one drives me crazy right because look i'm i'm all the way down to there is no essential carbohydrate right there's only two macronutrients you need protein and fat and um but i'm okay having some vegetation every now and then I, I enjoy something every now and then broccoli is one of my favorites but you know when you start looking at this stuff and people go well vinnie where am i gonna get my fiber from it's like well you don't need it. it's like well i couldn't poop last night it's like give your body a few days to settle in you'll be just fine you'll realize you never needed this stuff what say you yeah i i think that the evidence is very weak suggesting that dietary fiber is a requirement um i reading gary taubes and others i think i understand how we got there um but i i don't think that it is the essential nutrient that people have made it out to be and and there are other people i would defer to that do a better job of explaining that uh, you know the only you know ruminants have two sources of essential carbohydrate they have to have both the structural the fiber and the non-structural the sugar and starches the cell contents right in order for their rumen to function properly I mean, one of the interesting things is, as I said earlier, if you try to put more than 5% fat in a rumen's ration, you're going to depress fiber digestion, which is bad, very bad. Right. Um, but 70 some percent of the energy that it gets from its diet come from those short chain fatty acids. So it's converting that carbohydrate into fat for us instead of us right so again this this kind of idea that we have this essential link in the ecosystem we are no longer operating out in that ecosystem as we had to as our progenitors had to which is a good thing i'm all for it but meanwhile that those realities still exist that these ruminants are an essential link in the food chain in the energy flow and now we're learning to value them more and more in terms of ecosystem services somebody put it this way grazing beef or other ruminants on grassland is the only food producing system that we have that can share the ecosystem if we're going to produce vegetables or cranes or others We've got to dominate the ecosystem. We've got to wipe out whatever vegetation was there and then keep the wildlife at bay. Very Meanwhile, sadly, yeah, very, I showed that in my movie. It, you know, it was, I, I hated doing it, but you know, I always put the truth out there. And you know, you know, the vegan community will say something to the effect of, well, you know, they're, they're killing animals intentionally, and we're killing them by accident, it doesn't matter, the animals still dead. And you don't get to eat all the frogs and, uh, and moles and voles and everything else that that a combine is grinding up. And, um, 
nobody sees that they these guys have to hire snipers to go out at night and kill everything from deer to wild hogs and everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I used one farmer, we used him in, in the film, uh, uh, John was gracious enough to put himself on the line and do that. I, I could have had 10 other I could have made a whole film of, hey, look, this is what goes on at night, mm -hmm. so that you can have quinoa and soybeans and tofurkey and everything else. But I'll just show you one guy that's growing soybeans and show you what goes on. It's very sad. It's very sad because you can't do anything with the meat. Well, I, I think that, you know, so there's a couple things to kind of maybe get us close to closure. It seems to me like there's really three dietary choices available to Homo sapiens. You can be a vegan, a, no animal source food. You can be a carnivore, exclusively animal source food. You can be an omnivore. Now, for whatever reason, we want to play games and call them all kinds of flavors of vegetarian. But basically, my understanding writ large, vegetarian means you're not eating red meat. Right. But you are eating other animal source food. And even in places of the world where people think of them as being vegetarian, they're eating animal source food. And I've seen something along the lines of 95% of the world's vegetarians are economic vegetarians, not philosophical vegetarians. Right. That, that these are people who for what, and again, I'm going to argue that the problem today is that humanity's diet is plant-based. And doing the same thing harder is never makes sense for any kind of progress. And, and if people want to do something that's dependent on supplementation and highly processed foods, and they live in a high income country where they have those personal choices, wonderful, great. But that's not a viable solution for the vast majority of our brothers and sisters. And probably if we're going to have an honest conversation, it isn't a long term, you know, viable option for them either that we see the 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 reversion back to an omnivorous diet from people who try to do exclusively plant only diet so it, it, it there's just too many things that people are using to justify their arguments that when we go to other branches of science we say wait a minute here's this information here's this information here's this inform here's reality and none of it aligns with what you're saying Right. Right. And, and that's really, that's really the sad truth of it all. Um, Peter, we'll stop it there. But hang in there. I want to I want to say goodbye to you off the air. Um, folks, um, Villa Capelli, you know, people say to me, Vinny, do you do you drink any fruit juice? And the answer is yes, it's olive oil. It's fruit juice. Villa Capelli makes the best fruit juice in the world. Um, and people will say to me, wait, you're just talking about, you know, what about I, I can go get Bartoli's or this or that in the grocery store, our country, our great country that Peter and I were just talking about for the past hour, allows these, these big multinational companies, these, these big food companies to cut their olive oil as much as 40% here in the United States and still call it 100% pure olive oil. We don't let that happen over at Villa Capelli. It's 100% pure olive oil. You will taste the difference. I'm not kidding. There's three ways to save money when you go to Villa Capelli. Number one, there's the promo code. My name, Vinny, V-I-N-N-I-E. Do it at checkout. That's 10% off. But wait, there's more. As you know, whenever you buy anything in bulk, it's going to be cheaper. So the unit is going to be cheaper. Per ounce is going to be cheaper if you get a three liter 10 versus getting the little 750 milliliter bottle. It's cute and it looks good on your counter, but hey, we want to save money here. Get the three liter 10. And as a third way to save, if you spend over $100 after the 10% discount, you get free shipping. So put in that promo code Vinny, get that free shipping. So spend about $112, $115, and that'll bring it down to over 100. You'll be fine there. Villa Capelli, let them know we sent you V I N N I E no wimpy Y at checkout. Let them know that it came from us. Peter, Peter Ballastat is going to be everywhere this summer. If, if you like what you're hearing here, Peter, mention a couple of places where you're going to be where they can find you. 
Well, you can certainly find me on social media, uh, grass-based, one word on Twitter and Instagram, grass-based health on um, uh, Facebook. I have that page. I also have a blog by the same name. You can email me at peter.ballerstead at gmail.com. Uh, I'm going to be a keto fest later at, toward the end of July in New London, Connecticut, and encourage people to come to that community event. And I'll be appearing at as part of Low Carb USA in San Diego toward the end of August. Yeah, go check him out wherever he is, because uh, when this guy is on his feet, you're going to love it. I think he and I are the only two people out there that actually wear cowboy boots when we're doing our talks. Everyone else, oh, yeah, they're wearing suits, coats, ties. No, not me and Peter. Well, mm -hmm. Peter wears a coat. You wear a coat and tie when you're on stage, right? And yeah, because I have the cow ties and things. You know? That's right. You have those stupid cow ties that I love. <laughs> Sodfather. Uh, yeah, and they could barely get me to put on jeans and a T-shirt and a pair of boots. And and uh, I, I hope I'm never offending anyone. You know, whenever I'm, uh, you know, I was in Houston with, um, what's his name? A Dr. Indian doctor. What's his name? Heart, heart surgeon. Oh, um, uh, can't think of his name. Can you remember his name? Uh, it's right there. Yeah, me too. <laughs> shouldn't have done this. Usually, you shouldn't. Have yes. Say before yes. You low at, at low carb Houston. Yeah, and you know everyone else is dressed in an irons, and I'm up there with jeans and <laughs> boots, and I'm like, oh God, I think I'm offending half the people here. Uh, that's my university training coming out that I was taught taught to do that. So yeah, just throw a time. I, I should probably adopt that. I'm gonna start maybe wearing a throw a blazer on. I certainly have enough blazers. So you can check out Peter. And Peter, are you still doing the podcast? I have a podcast. It's been a little dormant. I'm going to resurrect that. Also, you can find me. I've got lots of talks that have been posted to YouTube. If you if you want me to come back on when you resurrect it, I would love to come on always love talking to you. And as you know, buddy, you're welcome here whenever you want to come here. Um, so please do that. I'm going to cut off this part, but we're still running tape for